tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 11. I'm your host, Otis Chirey. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing four stories for you about nocturnal nightmares, evil experiments, unusual addicts, and dangerous dates. Also, a warning to our more sensitive listeners, tonight's episode contains content of a particularly violent and emotionally jarring nature, and its stories with particularly sensitive subjects and situations, which some of you may find traumatizing or which may trigger stress and anxiety. If you are predisposed to panic attacks or suffer from PTSD, please be prepared. Thank you for your understanding. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first terrifying tale. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the tear, visit simplyscurrypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes to us from an author who goes by the moniker Starless in Bible Black. In it, a gentleman comes to terms with the fact that there are things lurking in the dark, heartless and inhuman, that don't care how much he loves his daughter, and will stop at nothing to get what it wants. Without further ado, I present to you Comus. There's an image I keep pushed away in the back of my mind. Occasionally it makes its way out and I can see that horrid face once more. My limbs go numb, and I can feel my throat begin to tighten as every grotesque detail can be seen in my mind's eye. No matter how hard I try to suppress it, there's no way to fully forget pure evil. I raised my children by myself. My wife had passed away in a car accident, She'd been hit by a drunk driver running a red light. My daughter, Elizabeth, was seven at the time, and my son, Nicholas, was only four. To this day, the greatest challenge I've faced in my life is having to tell them that their mother wasn't coming back. Even the day after the funeral, they walked around the house, expecting her to jump out from behind a curtain like she was just playing hide-and-seek the whole time. Perhaps it was due to their young minds being unable to grasp the loss of their mother at the time, but I feel they just didn't want to believe it. 
after I received her life insurance, I decided that we needed to move to a different part of the neighborhood. I wanted the children to still attend the same school and have the same friends, but I couldn't stand the bad memories I had in that house. Hardly a night went by when I didn't cry myself to sleep, with my hand feeling the empty spot beside me. It took a few months, but we eventually adjusted. Sometimes, when they were playing in the backyard, I would catch myself staring at my wife's portrait on the mantel above the fireplace. A smile would cross my face, and I would feel a tear run down my cheek. At this point, I no longer cried from sadness, but from happiness. I had finally accepted that she was in a better place, and our lives were going to get better. All of that changed the day I saw it in the woods behind our house. When we switched houses, we moved into one on the edge of our neighborhood. It was in a cul-de-sac, directly across from one of my children's friends. Not only was it a great social location for them, but I also desired a small bit of isolation for myself. I would still have my own companions over for a drink, but I did enjoy just sitting on my back porch, watching the birds fly around the trees in the backyard. The trees went on for what seemed like an eternity, giving me a feeling that I was the ruler of an endless domain that started in my backyard. One day, while I sat in my chair with a bottle of beer in my hand and a book in the other, I heard Elizabeth call from the edge of the lawn. When I asked her what she wanted, she turned to me with wide eyes and a trembling hand outstretched and pointing toward the woods. I strained my vision to try and find what she saw, but was unable to. I rested my book and drank down on a nearby table and walked across the grass to meet my daughter. I placed a hand on her shoulder and pulled her close and did my best to comfort her. What has you so scared, darling? Is there a fox or something out there? With her head still buried in my side, she shook it violently and continued to point. I followed her finger until I was staring at a large oak tree about ten feet from the edge of our lawn. The leaves scattered among its branches had changed colors, and a few of them littered the ground around the trunk. Beneath the roots that sprawled across the dirt, I spotted a hole. I hadn't noticed the tree before, but never expected that there would be an animal living underneath it. Honey, I can't help you if you don't tell me what's wrong. Now, I'm going to ask you again. What is it that you saw? Elizabeth took in a deep breath and spoke with fear grabbing at her vocal cords. That! I looked up from her and stared at the base of the tree. A hand covered in flawed gray skin slowly reached out and clawed at the earth outside of the hole. Long yellow fingernails scratched at the dirt until they dug deep into the damp soil. Now, with proper grip, I heard the creature let out a deep groan as it began to pull itself from the hole. As more of its limbs came into view, I took notice of how frail this thing appeared. I watched the thin muscles of its arms flex under its sickly skin to pull itself further out of the hole, revealing itself from the darkness underneath the tree. This unearthly creature lifted its head in the autumn sunlight, giving me the first glimpse of its face. It had sunken eyes and cheeks, causing the skin to be pulled tightly against its skull. Its bloodshot eyes would disappear from view as cracked eyelids slowly blinked. Greasy lumps of dark gray hair hung over the sides of its face and down the nape of its neck. The individual vertebrae of its spine pressed under its skin, shifting in a grotesque fashion as the body moved. I stood motionless in complete and utter shock. I could no longer hear the birds chirping or the wind in the leaves. The only noise I could hear was its thin and raspy breathing 
that croaked out of its throat. My daughter's hand had gripped my shirt and squeezed it tight. I could feel her shaking me as if she was trying to tell me something, but I couldn't hear her. My ears soon filled with the piercing shriek that erupted from deep inside this creature as more of its body became exposed in the sunlight. As it continued to scream, the body shook violently and limbs moved unnaturally. To this day, I'm not sure what made me grab my daughter and run, but I'm thankful that something finally made me move. Before I knew it, I was inside and had slammed the door shut. I turned the deadbolt and threw the latch on the top of the door. As I kept my eyes trained at the edge of our lawn for it to crawl onto the grass, I yelled at Elizabeth to go grab my gun from the drawer in my nightstand. She left and soon returned with the weapon firmly grasped in her hand. I took it from her and quickly disengaged the safety. I cocked it and stood at the ready to unload every single bullet into this hellish monstrosity. As I stood guard, I instructed my daughter to call the police, tell them to send officers out here. Two squad cars arrived in less than ten minutes. It was no coincidence that I bought a house within close proximity to the police station. As I followed two officers toward the edge of the backyard, all three of us, with our weapons drawn, another stayed inside with my daughter. Although they approached the tree without much hesitation, I kept my distance, knowing what lurked inside that dark hole. With their weapons trained on the opening, one of them retrieved the flashlight from his belt and flashed it inside. What they found was... Nothing. They stuck their flashlights all the way inside until they could see every inch of that burrow. There was nothing inside of it. There wasn't a single trace of something ever being in there. The first thought that jumped to my mind was that they would think I was trying to stage some kind of hoax. However, they simply told me to keep an eye out for the creature again and to call them if I saw it again. They also recommended that I keep a camera on me, on the off chance that I could snap a picture of this thing. After comforting my daughter, they left us alone in my house. To this day, I'm convinced that they remembered my wife's death a few years prior and thought it best to not try claiming that I was uh, running a prank on them. They probably figured that I had had enough trouble in my life and that there was no need to fake something like this. Four years passed without me ever seeing any sign of it. Whenever it reared its ugly head again, it was in a way I had not even imagined. My daughter had just turned 11, and I permitted her to have some friends over for a sleepover. I talked the trouble to push all the furniture in our living room to one side and make a large area for them to put their sleeping bags down. I told Elizabeth that I wanted them to sleep inside because there had been sightings of coyotes around the area, but she didn't seem to buy it. She knew the real reason why I didn't want them outside at night, and she didn't disagree with that one bit. While I spent the night with Nicholas in our media room watching a movie, I would occasionally hear the girls laughing or letting out a playful scream. I tried telling myself that the screams were only due to some stupid game, but my mind tried telling me that something else could be the source. After the movie ended, I carried my boy upstairs and tucked him into bed. Afterwards, I peered from the railing of the stairs at the girls asleep on the living room floor. They had arranged themselves such that they were around a toy lantern. With sleep pulling at my eyelids, I retreated to my room and fell asleep. The next thing I knew, I was awoken by the sound of glass hitting the floor and my Elizabeth screaming. Instinctively, I grabbed the gun from the drawer in my nightstand and ran down the stairs. As I bolted into the living room, I noticed empty sleeping bags scattered around the floor. It didn't take me long to find the girls clustered into one corner of the room with a lantern shared among them. The sickly yellow light emitted by the cheap bulb illuminated the fear on their faces. Elizabeth, what the hell happened down here? I asked as I stared at the broken window. 
whatever had broken it, had done so from outside. I was met with only the sound of crickets chirping in the night air. I turned to the girls in the corner and found them all pointing out the window. It was at that moment that an overwhelming sense of dread filled my body. I felt the urge to vomit as my mind raced to the only conclusion. It had come back. I bolted to the back door and threw it open. As I ran out into the backyard, I yelled at the girls to call the police. My bare feet slammed onto the ground as I sprinted full force toward the forest at the edge of our lawn. By the time I reached the edge, the ankles of my sweatpants were soaked with dew. Cupping my hands around my mouth, I hollered my daughter's name. The only response I received was my pain-stricken voice echoing back at me. I took in a deep breath and prepared to call for her once more when I stopped. Crawling under a bush just a few feet away, I saw its face for the first time in years. In the milky glow of moonlight, it slowly clawed at the ground and pulled itself out from under the bush. With each small movement of its appendages, I could hear the cracking of joints and dry leaves scratching against its leathery skin. This thing had taken my daughter, and I wanted nothing more than to grab it by the neck, strangle it, and slowly feel the life leave its body. And the problem was that I couldn't. As much as I wanted to, I found myself unable to move. Compared to the burning hatred I had for this creature, my fear towered over that and kept my movement at bay. Slowly, its mouth opened to reveal pointed, stained teeth. It let out a heavy breath, causing the air around me to suddenly be filled with a horrid stench of rot and decay. As I pulled my shirt over my nose, it began to make a noise. It started as a guttural rumble from deep within the creature. Soon enough, it escaped into the air as a deep croak. This progressively became louder as the noise underwent a grotesque transformation into an ear-piercing shriek. I could feel my eardrums screaming for relief, causing me to throw my hands over my ears. This did little good, as the noise still managed to find its way into my head. When the noise finally stopped, I lowered my hands and opened my eyes. It was gone. There was no trace that it had ever been there. The ground underneath the bush showed no signs of anything ever being there. I found myself unable to look away from that spot. I'm unsure how long I stood there. It took three police officers to shake me back to reality. When I was finally able to break my gaze from that bush, I screamed. I fell to my knees and erupted into a fit of hot tears and screams. I pounded at the ground and grabbed the grass. I expected the officers to try to bring me back to my feet, but they let me continue. It was nearly a week before they found her body. She was almost a mile from the house, deep in the woods. Although I could not bring myself to go out there to view the crime scene, I was given a description of the area later that day. They found her under a thin layer of dried leaves, with her torn and stained clothes tossed around. She'd been violated. My little girl, my little eleven-year-old girl, had been raped and tortured by whatever the hell this thing was. It took her innocence, her purity, her very existence. The funeral was one of the hardest days of my life. While everyone else cried in the cold November rain, I stood silent and unmoving while staring at the small coffin. All the despair I felt had left my body with the tears I cried for days on end. No matter how much I wanted to cry, I couldn't bring myself to do so. My tear ducts, like my heart and soul, were empty. I still visit her gravesite on her birthday. Other than that, I can't bring myself to look at her name engraved in that cold stone. 
There are no pictures of her anywhere in my home. The sight of her face brings me to my knees and leaves my eyes red with hot tears. I still have pictures of my wife, but this, this is different. When the drunk driver who killed her was sentenced to life in prison, without the possibility of parole, I felt closure. Elizabeth is different. That creature is still out there. That thing that killed my daughter and violated her is still prowling somewhere in those woods. Elizabeth's pictures are neatly stacked in a box upstairs. Until the day I find that thing, I can't stand to look at her face. I feel that I let her down by not attacking it that night. My fear got the better of me, and it still haunts me to this day. It's not a guarantee that I would have been able to stop this thing, but at least I would have done the best I could. Nicholas has grown up. He went to college, got a degree in mechanical engineering. Soon afterward, he found a girlfriend and eventually got married to her. They had a child a few years later. To this day, I won't let my granddaughter Elizabeth come to visit. I fear that it will rear its ugly head once more if it knows she's here. Sometimes, when I'm lying in bed at night, I think I hear something in the woods. It's always faint and almost to the point that I think my mind is playing tricks on me. However, I'll listen closely and make out the words that this creature is uttering in its deep, raspy voice. Comus rape. Comus break. Sweet young virgin's virtue take. Naked flesh, flowing hair. Her terror screams. They cut the air. But no one hears her there. I hope you enjoyed Comus by author Starless and Bible Black, as performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got another terrifying tale for you, this one from author Zion Johnson. In it, we'll meet a gentleman who learns the hard way that in spite of a man's curiosity, some things in this world are better left undiscovered. Without further ado... I present to you the Harbinger Experiment. The world we live in is full of things we don't understand. Being the curious humans that we are, we naturally try and seek these things out. Doing so has led us to remarkable discoveries and inventions that we never could have imagined a hundred years ago. We have defeated disease, built to the sky itself, and even created machines that could take us beyond the clouds and into the stars. If our ancestors could see us and what we've created, I'm sure many of them would see us as gods. Our innate curiosity and lust for knowledge has not always led us to greatness, however. True evil and darkness have also been uncovered in humanity's conquest of knowledge. And in the end, I fear this evil will be our doom. I do not say this from the standpoint of a great philosopher who has sat and simply pondered things either. No, I say this because I have seen it experienced it. I was a part of it. The event I'm about to relay to you is true in its entirety. This, I, I swear. I feel certain that this will fall on their fears, and many of you will believe this to be just another spooky story meant to give you cheap thrills. But I promise you, that this is neither my intent nor my purpose. 
The purpose of this story is to simply warn you of what lurks beyond the veil of what we can see and understand, to show you what awaits us in the darkness, even if I myself don't understand it. What I'm about to tell you has happened, and I feel certain it will happen again. In 1971, a not-so-well-known scientist began preparation for an extremely secretive project known simply as the Harbinger Experiment. I would like to keep the identity of the scientist a secret for personal reasons, so throughout this recounting I will refer to him as Zimmerman. Zimmerman's background is unclear at best, beyond 1971. All that is known about him before that time is that he had grown up somewhere in Maryland with a strange fascination of the occult and supernatural. This latter made him an outcast among his fellow scientists due to how scoffed upon the metaphysical was, and still is, at the time. Zimmerman's options concerning the otherworldly were not the sole cause for him being an outcast, though. It was his methods that made him widely unaccepted among his peers. Zimmerman was well known during this time for being ruthless and cold beyond measure. He never cared about the means. All that mattered to him was results, and if he predicted the results to be valuable enough, anything would be worth obtaining them. It was this insatiable and brutal lust for the truth that made him feared among those that knew of him, and the few that knew of him and did not fear him believed in him and followed him and his work closely. The word harbinger itself has such a mysterious and intimidating taste to it. Maybe it's the way it rolls off our tongues, or maybe it's simply due to its association with the project. But the word always seems to carry a certain amount of doom with it. Which would make sense. The word itself means to warn or forebode. I can't imagine Zimmerman's reasons for giving the experiment this title, but in retrospect, it fits perfectly. Zimmerman came to a select few, me being one of them. He told us he was working on something big, and that he needed people who could keep confidentiality and not spread idle gossip of his work. While he did not fully trust some of us, he did know that we were professionals and that for some reason or another we were all in dire need of employment. I had worked at the local clinic as a doctor, but I was caught stealing medication and was promptly fired. This left a very dark mark on my resume, so work was hard to find. I also was a native to Alaska and lived near where the experiment would take place. So I guess you could say I was a convenient choice. As you can imagine, I jumped at the opportunity. It was hard not to when I saw the payout. Fifteen of us were hired in total. Some were colleagues of his that had been working with him for a while. Some were maintenance workers, and a few were hired as private security. I was the only medical professional to be hired. It is still a wonder to me how he even attained the funds necessary for the experiment. I would not be wholly surprised if his financing was not entirely legal. But, legal or not, I needed the money and he was paying. Looking back, it's a decision I have come to regret. After Zimmerman obtained his money, he used it to buy a relatively large plot of land deep in the frozen wilderness of Alaska. And upon that piece of land, 
Zimmerman built a concrete structure, not dissimilar to a bunker, in fact, the sole difference being that its goal was to keep any potential damage contained within the structure rather than keeping it out, as he put it. Most of the structure dug underneath the earth, which had the effect of making the underground complex seem so much smaller than it really was from the outside, as would be expected. There was only one way of entering and leaving the underground structure, and it was via a ladder that led from a small, unassuming concrete building on the surface, which I will refer to from now on as the entrance building for convenience, to the network below. After everyone had gone to bed that night, the hatch that contained the ladder would be sealed off with a very large and thick metal lid. Zimmerman was very strict about this. Located not too far away from the entrance building was a series of wooden cabins that would serve as the sleeping quarters for the staff Zimmerman had hired. Compared to the entrance building standing on the surface, the underground system was massive. At the center of the complex was the control room. This was where all the facilities, electronics and such were linked to. This included security cameras, lights and door controls. Consoles, monitors and computers lined the walls of this large central chamber. This is also where the ladder in the entrance building connected to in the underground complex. Connected to the control room were three doors. One led to a smaller room that served as the infirmary. Another door led to a break room, and the last door led into the hallways. The hallways are where the complex began to feel extremely eerie. They were, for some reason, laid out in an extremely confusing scheme that led in circles and to complete dead ends. These hallways made up a vast majority of the complex, and it would be very easy to get lost in the maze if you were unfamiliar with the complex. But if you knew where you were going, you would find yourself standing before one of three eight-by-eight eight rooms before long. Each room had a camera hooked up to one of the corners of the room, and all three of those cameras were connected to a corresponding monitor in the control room. Cameras were also scattered throughout the hallways so that whoever was watching their corresponding monitor could see anywhere they wanted to when they wanted to. Thick metal doors stood at the entrance to each of the three 8 by 8 foot rooms and in order to open them you would have to enter a four digit code into a panel located near the door. I remember when I first arrived at the complex how badly the hallways frightened me. I have always been claustrophobic, you see. Those hallways were so very narrow. The noise, or more accurately the lack of noise, was also a tremendous source of fear for me in those bleak, narrow hallways. It was always so unnaturally silent as if the entire world had stopped moving. It really made you feel like you were trapped down there. Thankfully, though, I only rarely ventured into those hallways, for I was the only medical professional in the facility, and I had virtually no reason to go into them. In the beginning, I found it so peculiar that Zimmerman would ask for a medical professional like me, on a project like this, but by the time it was all over, I understood why. The official purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to test and observe the effects of extended isolation on the human mind. This is what was listed on reports, being sent out at least, but unbeknownst to all those who were not participating in the project, excluding the subject, the true purpose was much darker. Like I said before, 
Zimmerman had always had an obsession with the occult and supernatural. He sought to prove himself to those who did not believe in him. He wanted physical proof that the supernatural was a real phenomenon, and he wanted to be the first one to attain said proof. The true purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to find proof of the metaphysical, a world we could not see. The thought of doing this was naturally a tad bit daunting and even scary, but it was Zimmerman's method of doing so that was truly terrifying. Zimmerman believed that he would be able to open a portal between worlds momentarily, allowing three random entities to cross over to our world, and each one of these beings would be trapped within one of three rooms. Zimmerman had the theory that any entity would try and latch on to the nearest living thing that had the capacity for it. He wanted to use this technique to trap a spirit in a physical form by allowing it to enter a living being that had been injected with a compound mixture of Zimmerman's creation. In theory, this compound would keep the entity from simply leaving whatever it was attached to. The only way it would be able to leave a host who had been injected with the compound was through death. According to Zimmerman, the host would have to be something living, with a will strong enough to survive the possession. And there is only one known species that possess the amount of will required for this. Humans. Zimmerman had also done something to ensure that the entities would only enter the three rooms, and that there would only be one entity in each room, though I cannot say I know exactly what he did. In fact, I know next to nothing when it comes to how Zimmerman managed to do what he did. He liked to keep his methodology a secret to his most trusted colleagues, most likely due to his paranoia that someone would steal his ideas and take credit for the success of said ideas. If I had known that this was the true purpose before I signed up, I may have reconsidered. But Zimmerman decided not to tell us until we were all gathered at his fortress. Even if any of us wanted to leave, I doubt we would have been able to do so. The security team Zimmerman had hired was loyal to him and the payout. It is not likely that Zimmerman had given them the order to allow anyone to leave. There were three different subjects included in the experiment. All were native to Alaska, and each one was lured into the project under the belief that they would be participating in a harmless study of the effect of isolation on the human mind, as I mentioned before, which is why none of the subjects objected when they realized that they would be confined to one of the three rooms that I mentioned earlier. The first subject was a young man. He was apparently out of work and desperately needed the money that had been offered for participating in the study. The second was a woman, by looking at her. I could tell she was an addict of some sort. The third and final subject was an older man, a drifter, if I had to guess. One thing that they all had in common was that none of them had any family or friends left. In short, no one would miss them, which is why they were chosen for this project. I'm so sorry. I wish I could supply more information about the subjects, but all of this has been drawn from memory, and I was given a little information on the three to begin with. The experiment did not officially begin until 1987, 16 years after its original announcement. I was eager to begin, so I packed up and headed out to the complex as soon as I could. I arrived at the compound a week before the subjects had even signed up. In a whole month, 
before the project even began. I was not the first to arrive by any means. When I got there, Zimmerman, his colleagues, and the security team had already arrived. I suppose you could say I was among the people Zimmerman did not trust to arrive first. Everyone had arrived but a week before the experiment began. There was a noticeable rift between those who were there simply for the money, like me, and those who were followers of Zimmerman. On October 15, 1987, all the preparations were in place. The subjects had been sealed in their rooms, the cameras, lights, and speakers were fully operational, and all the staff members had settled in. The time had come for the experiment to officially begin. Zimmerman asked everyone to report to the control room around 9 p.m. to witness the beginning of the experiment. He wanted everyone to be present when he proved that all his theories had been correct and that he was not just a madman. He wanted us all to see the fruits of his labor. When everyone had finally gathered in the large control room, Zimmerman turned to us and simply said, Observe. He then turned his back to us, leaned into the microphone that would project his voice through the three rooms, and then he began chanting in a strange language that I feel certain no one but Zimmerman could understand. We all observed the three large monitors on the wall, silently waiting for something to happen. The subjects all stood in the room, dumbstruck by Zimmerman's chanting, staring at the monitors with confused expressions on their faces. After about five minutes, I felt something. Awful. I cannot explain what exactly it was, but a horrible feeling of dread washed over me, riddling me with fear. It was then that the ground actually began to shake suddenly, and the lights began to flicker, Zimmerman continued chanting into the microphone as if nothing was off or wrong, while the subjects began dashing around their rooms, screaming for help. Then suddenly the ground stopped shaking, and the monitor's images turned into static. The air began to become very heavy as we all stared at the monitors, waiting for them to regain their image and show us what was happening or what had happened in those three rooms. For a while, all was silent. But then there was screaming. The screams of a woman going through unbearable pain, and terror began to echo through the compound. The similar screams of men began to coincide with the woman's terrified screams, and together they mixed into an awful symphony of pain and fear that beat mercilessly into our ears. Those of us who were here for the money began to give each other scared looks, while those loyal to Zimmerman seemed completely unfazed. We wanted to leave and never come back to this awful place, but we all knew deep down that Zimmerman would never allow that to happen. We were here for the long haul. There was no escape. It was 10.13 p.m., when the screaming finally stopped. The monitors had yet to reveal to us what had occurred in those three rooms. As soon as the screaming ended, Zimmerman stood and dismissed us all for the night, adding that we were all forbidden to come back into the compound until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, not like any of us wanted to. We all solemnly made our way out of the compound and toward the cabins and settled in for the night. I feel it is safe to say that not all of us slept well that night, and I was not one of them. The following morning, all of the staff had arrived at the entrance building. We all stood inside, exchanging tired or nervous looks, as we waited for Zimmerman to arrive and open the hatch that concealed the ladder. I could see palpable fear in the eyes of some of us while others did not seem to have 
being even remotely affected by what happened last night. Zimmerman showed up five minutes after ten, apologizing for his tardiness as he came through the door of the entrance building. He opened the hatch and, without any hesitation, began descending the ladder downwards into the black abyss. He almost seemed enthusiastic. I was the first to follow behind Zimmerman's dark descent into the facility. It seemed that the farther I climbed down, the more the darkness closed in on me, as if it was trying to swallow me whole. As I climbed deeper, I couldn't help but feel that this place was different somehow. While before, there was only the unsettling concrete hallways and rooms, now there was something else. Something made the eeriness feel so real and personified. I felt like a horrible and gruesome scene awaited us down there, but I continued climbing downward, despite my fear and my hesitation. This was no longer just a spooky bunker. There was darkness and malevolence in the air. A true evil now lived here, and I could feel it. We all could. I finally felt my foot touch ground and let out a silent sigh of relief to be on solid ground. Almost as if on cue, the light bulbs came alive, dowsing the room in their warm and welcome light. Zimmerman must have turned on the power, I thought. I allowed myself to take a couple of seconds to examine the control room. It was exactly as we had left it last night, for which I gave a silent and thankful prayer. It was almost as if nothing unusual had ever happened. I shook myself from my thoughts as I remembered the static-filled monitors from the night before. I let my eyes slowly make their way toward the monitors on the wall, anticipating the grim and fearful scenes that would be on them. My attention was first grabbed by monitor one and three, which were still pure static. It would have been a small relief, but then the motionless image on monitor two caught my eye. Room two was entirely still, and everything seemed entirely untouched. I couldn't help but gasp as I noticed the only thing that was different. The woman lay in the center of the small concrete room, an expression of fear and terror was frozen onto her gaunt face as she lay silent and lifeless on her back. Zimmerman's expression turned angry when he saw this. He ordered that the second monitor be turned off, and it was. We didn't ask why. It's not like any of us wanted to see the dreadful scene any longer. He also ordered that if the images in monitors one and three did not return within the next two hours, the security team would be sent to investigate the rooms. The security team nodded at hearing this. They made it seem as if they had no fear, but I could see it in their eyes. The subtly loud tick-tock of the clock was the only sound that echoed through the control room while I stared at the monitors. An hour and fifty minutes had gone by, and static was still all that occupied monitor one and three. All of the other staff members were working except me. This was due to the fact that the project had been completely injury-free thus far, so I essentially had nothing to do but wait for someone to hurt themselves. Zimmerman, a couple of his colleagues, and I were the only ones that occupied the room. They quietly chatted amongst each other on the other side of the room while I spent my time reading and pondering the situation I currently found myself in. I had clearly made a mistake coming here. The corpse lying in room two was evidence enough of this. God only knew what awaited us in rooms one and three. My thoughts were soon interrupted as Monitor 3's image returned. The clear image now displayed on the screen made everyone's eyes noticeably widen. 
What was displayed on the monitor was horrifying. A humanoid thing stood in the center of the room staring directly at the camera, unmoving. It was wearing the jumpsuit that Subject 3 had been issued, but this clearly was not the same man that had entered the room. What caught my attention first was its eyes. They were solid black and twice the size of normal human eyes. They seemed so... so endless and so cold. Its head had also grown with the eyes in such a symmetrical and unsettling manner. The being also shed all of the hair it once had, and even from the monitor I could see how unnaturally smooth and clear its skin was. It had also seemingly grown in height and stature, which could be seen in the fact that the jumpsuit was obviously far too small for its wear. The limbs had grown especially long, its arms hung almost as low as the creature's knees. What we were looking at was in no way the same man we had sent inside. Fear. Fear was all I felt as I continued to stare into the monitor at the thing in the room. And my fear seemed to be shared by those around me, which made me feel kind of good. It may sound awful, but it was a bit satisfying to see that Zimmerman and his colleagues could feel fear too. But at the same time, it was worrying because this showed that this was not a part of Zimmerman's plan. Something had gone wrong. We all stared into the monitor at the thing despite our fear. It was almost as if we were in a trance. My already present fear began to grow and spread rapidly through my body as I became lost in the creature's eyes, trapped in its terrifyingly hypnotic gaze. After what felt like forever, I managed to break eye contact with the creature and divert my attention from the monitor, and when I did so, I felt my fear levels drop considerably. After a short while, Zimmerman ordered his security team to make their way to Subject 1's door, just as he said he would do. The security team left without question, armed only with batons and pistols. I focused my attention on watching the men progress through the hallways, towards Subject 1's room via the cameras. Even through the not-so-high quality cameras, it wasn't hard to tell that these men were afraid of what awaited them. Their heads were downcast as they walked. They did not possess the same confidence within them that they did when this project began. They looked like little scared boys being sent off to a terrible war. Eventually, they made it to the door. We had perfect vision of them and the door via the hallway camera. One of them said something through one of their walkie-talkies and made a motion toward the camera. In response, one of Zimmerman's colleagues buzzed the door open. The men already had their pistols out by the time the button was pushed. Slowly, the door began to open. We all watched eagerly as the men began to approach the door, guns aimed inside. Suddenly, and without warning, there was a loud shriek, and as something bounded out of the room at the men, the monitor turned into static. Immediately, we could hear screaming echoing down the hallways, followed shortly after by the distinct sound of gunshots. We could do nothing but wait. After a couple of minutes, the screaming and gunshots stopped, we all waited and prayed, hoping that whatever bounded at them from the room would not be the one to return to the control room. After a couple more minutes, three of the men came back, carrying with them the corpse of the fourth. He had massive cuts covering his chest, and his face was shredded. You couldn't even tell who he was anymore, or even that he was human. I was used to gore, being a doctor and all, so I felt somewhat unfazed by the mass of shredded flesh and bloodied meat they carried with them. 
but many of the others went pale and vomited. The security team all wore emotionless expressions and eyes filled with terror. One of the men finally looked up at us. He stared at us for a while with those wide eyes of his. It's dead. He finally managed to mutter in a shaken and scared voice. A couple hours went by. The dead man's name was Frank. He was buried outside in the cold Alaskan ground. Two of the men were unharmed, physically at least. The third was alive, but only barely. His body was covered in bloody slashes, and one of his eyes had been gouged out. I managed to stabilize him, but only just. The other two men vaguely explained what happened. Apparently, Subject One leaped out at Frank after the door had opened, only it wasn't really Subject One anymore. According to them, it had a hideously contorted face and long, sharp claws. They claimed to have shot it over a dozen times before it fell dead, and then they emptied another dozen bullets just to make sure it was really dead. Only once it was dead did they come back. After tending to the wounded man, I went to investigate the monitors. As afraid as I was of seeing what those monitors may have held, I needed to see. Subject 3 was the only one left now, and I needed to see it and make sure the creature was still in his room. It seemed to be more like a jail cell than an ordinary room at this point, though, which was probably a good thing. The cameras displaying Subject 1's room and the hallway outside it still displayed a static-filled screen. No one was sent to repair them or investigate. We just had to hope that Subject 1 was well and truly dead. Monitor 3's image was exactly the same as I had left it. Subject 3 was still staring directly into the camera at us. He was still in the exact same position, and if it were not for the small fan in the corner of the room, I would think I was looking at a still image. In a way, I felt relief at seeing this. Relief that he was still in his room and had not escaped while no one was looking. After everything quieted down, I noticed something especially unusual. There was a strange sound emanating from somewhere. At first, it was barely noticeable. The only reason I heard it was because of how extremely quiet it was in the infirmary. But as time went by, it slowly began to increase in volume. After about an hour, it was loud enough that everyone else could hear it too. And after a couple more hours, its volume had increased so much we could determine what the noise was. It was a song. One of the staff members identified it as Living in the Sunlight by Tiny Tim. Apparently his father loved the song and listened to it frequently. The song seemed to be on a loop and kept replaying itself. Although we were able to identify the noise, we remained unable to identify its source. We knew that it wasn't coming from the speakers because we had turned them off. It seemed to be emanating from the walls themselves. More time ticked by as we all began to become increasingly agitated by the song. I spent most of my time in the infirmary, attending to Frank or in the control room. Fear hung in the air, and the presence of unmistakable darkness and evil was no doubt its source. Subject 3 still had not moved. He had kept his unblinking gaze fixed on the camera the entire time. It always felt like he was staring directly at me, no matter where I was in the room. I think this effect was also felt by others due to the fact that they seemed to move around the room a lot and for seemingly no reason. 
After a few hours, the song was so loud that people almost had to shout in order to communicate. We'd been trying to find its source so that we could turn the song off, but it was to no avail. The source was completely unidentifiable. This added a level of extreme irritation to our already very present fear. It was around 8.30 that the ground itself began to shake once again, just as it had done the previous night. Panic began to spread among my fellow employees and me as the shaking grew in intensity. During this, I had the sudden instinctual feeling to look over at Subject 3's monitor. It was gone. Almost as if on cue, the power went out. Thankfully, the song did as well. Ever since the security team came back, panic had slowly been building up among the staff, and Zimmerman was powerless to stop it. When those lights went out, the calm projections that everyone had been trying to maintain left us, and the fear in all our hearts took over. The emergency backup lights kicked on shortly after the power went out, which I gave a silent, thankful prayer for. The lights were dim, but they still allowed me to see a lot. Total panic seized us as many of my fellow staff members began screaming and rushing to the ladder in an attempt to escape. But too many were trying to use it at once, and no one was able to get very far in the ladder without someone else pulling them to the floor and taking their place. Zimmerman was shouting for everyone to calm down, but his dominating and intimidating personality had no effect here, and his demands fell upon deaf ears. It was total chaos. It wasn't long until people actually started hurting each other in their desperate attempts to get up that ladder and out of this place. I could only stand against the wall and wait for my opportunity to escape up the ladder. All the screams were soon silenced as the familiar hum of that unsettling song began to rise in volume again, only this time much quicker. And this time... It was clear that the noise was coming directly from the maze-like corridors. People stopped fighting and shouting as all our attention shifted to the door that led into the hallways. The song quickly got louder than it had ever been before, which forced many of us to cup our ears with our hands in an attempt to silence the noise. Then, suddenly, the song just completely stopped. Silence. That was all that filled the room as we stared at the thick metal door in anticipation for what was coming. It felt like ages had gone by, but in reality it was probably just seconds before the silence was broken. The door suddenly and violently burst open, and the music started again louder than it had ever been before. The suddenness and the volume of this caused many of us to recoil by falling to the ground and grabbing our ears in an attempt to block out the noise. I glanced up for just a second, and in the doorway stood a tall, smooth-skinned figure with long limbs and eyes so dark and malevolent you could clearly see them in the dim lighting. After I got my bearings, I looked upwards at the creature once again just in time to see the thing pick up and rip Zimmerman in half in one fluid movement, dousing the room and everyone in it with his blood, intestines, and organs. I was no stranger to gore, but the sight of that was too much for me to bear. I hunched over immediately after seeing this and vomited all over the cold cement floor. That ladder is my only hope of survival, I thought to myself, as I forced myself to a standing position. And as my eyes rose along with the rest of me, I could see the thing ripping and tearing through the people as they scattered in an attempt to escape it. 
was distracted, and as awful as it sounds, this was my only chance to get up that ladder. I forced my legs to move toward the ladder, trying to block out the terrified screams of my fellow staff members and the unbearably loud music. I could hear gunshots coinciding with the screams and terrible sounds of flesh being ripped apart somewhere in the mess of noise. I reached my hands outwards and felt a wave of relief wash over me as my fingers came into contact with the hard metal rungs of the ladder. I gripped them and began to climb upwards as quickly as I could in my disoriented state, all the while praying that the monster would not see me and pull me off the ladder and back into the slaughter. It felt like at any moment I would feel one of its smooth hands wrap around my ankles and pull me to my death, but I eventually made it to the top. There was no question in my mind. I had to close the hatch and seal that thing down there, even if it meant certain death for my colleagues. I could not allow that thing to escape. I gripped the thick metal lid and began to push with all my might in an attempt to seal the underground complex off. Despite how dense and sturdy it was, the lid was surprisingly easy to move and did not take very much effort to push it over the hatch, even in my weakened state. In seconds, the hatch was completely covered by the dense metal lid. I collapsed on my side and began to vomit some more as exhaustion overtook me. And as I lay there, I realized something. Aside from my labored breaths, the only thing I could hear was the faint echo of that song from down below. I felt as though I would lose more of my sanity if I continued to lay there and listen to that song. So I once again forced myself up to my feet and began to make my way to the wooden lodge I had stayed in the previous night. It was where I had left my baggage and also where I had left the keys to my truck. Of the 15 staff members that took part in that forsaken experiment, I am the only one that survived. I've never returned to the awful place where all this happened, and I don't intend to. The project was very secretive, and Zimmerman was the only one who knew all the details of it. As far as I know, no one is aware of my involvement aside from me. In fact, I am probably the only one who knows what the Harbinger experiment truly was, let alone what actually happened. By now, you are probably wondering why I have told you about something none of you should be aware of. Maybe you're expecting me to give you a speech about not messing with things you don't understand or something along those lines. I hope not for I have no speech to give or lesson to impart. I began hearing a noise earlier today. Almost immediately I recognized the noise as a very haunting and familiar song. I didn't even try to trace it to its source. I knew it would be pointless. And as the day has progressed, the song has increased in volume. It's loud enough now that I can very clearly make out the lyrics. I'm completely unable to escape Tiny Tim's voice. It has followed me everywhere I've gone. Subject three is coming for me. And I know my time left in this world is extremely limited now. I guess you could say that I just wanted to tell the tale of the Harbinger experiment before it was lost forever. I hope that you will take some lesson from what I have recounted to you, but I think we both know you won't. Let's be honest. You don't believe a word of what I've just told you, and I don't blame you. I wouldn't believe me if I were you. To you, this is nothing more than something to get cheap thrills from probably mindlessly or surfing the internet when you clicked a link and found yourself here, wherever here may be, reading this story. 
had to be honest. I don't care if you believe me or not. Even if you do, it probably won't stop you from trying to uncover the truth of a darkness that few of us have ever seen. It certainly never stopped Zimmerman. If you want a lesson, look at what happened to him when he went seeking the truth. I pray that none of you will ever discover this truth. I pray that none of you ever have to see the evil I have seen. I hope you all get to live in ignorance of what lies beyond the veil of what we can understand. It's here now. I can feel its black eyes burning into me just as I could all those years ago. I am as much to blame as Zimmerman is for the monstrosity that is now free to roam the world, even if I was not the one to create it. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I hope you enjoyed the Harbinger Experiment by author Zion Johnson, as performed by yours truly. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Gyrie. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program, 
and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>